Hi, everybody. Um, it's great to be here, and thank you so much for having me. Um, so, yes, today I'm going to be talking to you all about the Cybermen uh, and myself and what we do at RK Media. Um, so, just to start, my name's Jordan. I am from London. I'm 25 years old, and I'm the co founder of a business called RK Media. Uh, so, just a bit about me uh, I started my career at Vice uh, in 2015. Uh, when I was about 17 years old, before moving to Lab Bible. Uh, so Lab Bible, I don't know how much you guys know about Lab Bible, Unilab, but one of the biggest social publishers. Uh, I was there to help sort of build their agency and, and start their journey to aging up a little bit more from the, I guess, the more problematic stuff that they started off doing. Uh, and then from there, I went to YMU. So YMU is a talent management company looking after entertainers, sports, athletes, uh, musicians, and so on. Uh, and then finally to Arcade, where we are now. Um, so yeah, this is us. Um, it's myself, uh, Sam, my co-founder, Aaron, and then the Sidemen boys. Um, and yeah, we came together to, to, I guess, support the boys in their next stage of their career. They've been going for the last nine years, it'll be 10 years next year. Um, and we came to them to help take it to that next step. Um, how many of you guys know about the Sidemen in the audience? Follow them, subscribe. OK, cool. That's good. Great. Wonderful. Um, but first, I want to take you back to 2016, when I had an infinitely worse haircut than this, and apparently so did JJ, um, when I first met the guys. So we actually first met at their charity football match in 2016 in Southampton. Did any of you watch that game? It was a while ago. I don't know if anybody did. But it was their first charity match where they raised money for charity. They took over a whole stadium. And it was the first time for me that I sort of witnessed what I can only describe as a phenomenon in terms of audience. The boys sold out, I think it was 13,000 tickets to like half the stand of the stadium, which is all the government in, in Southampton would allow. Uh, they sold it out in a minute, of course. And it was absolutely chaos. I remember going there, seeing all these, this whole wall of young people just in awe of these boys and their friends. Um, and it really sort of blew my mind. I mean, this is JJ when we first met. He won't probably remember this now. Uh, but I was, on, I was working at Sport Bible, and this was on their Snapchat. Oh, what's Snapchat? Oh. Yo, I'm on Live Bible right now, and uh, we're literally about to head off to the Sandman football match. So let's do this, yo. Yeah, I mean, what were we doing with our hair? I have no idea. <laughs> absolutely no idea. Um, but it had caused this, and this is the thing. I don't know, again, if you guys didn't see it, you won't remember this. But those 13,000 young people, kids, and their parents at the time, uh, they, at the end of the match, and I'll never forget this, they swarmed the pitch. And I remember being down there on the touchline um, with all of the boys after the game, when all these kids running, it was like a zombie film. It was terrifying. But what it showed to me was they could galvanize an audience in a way that I'd never seen before. I'd worked with people with huge followings and big celebrities and talent, but nothing ever like this. This was another level. And this was also 2016. Obviously, fast forward now, we're many years after that. And I remember being pushed into the tunnel, all of us as players rammed down the touchline, and then the security guards had to barricade the doors in because all these kids were like knocking on the doors, like screaming. It was literally The Walking Dead, but with 12-year-old kids. Um, but what it showed to me was that these boys, yeah, they had a connection to their audience that was unmatched. I'd never seen anything like it, and it was enough of a seed to realize that this is, I think, where the future of this whole media industry, as I'm sure you guys do, it really is. And it's funny how the world, I guess, comes together a few years later. Um, so who are the Sidemen? Um, well, there's seven of the boys. I don't know, again, if you guys know them, um, you'll know who they are. But there's Josh, uh, Toby, uh, Simon, Harry, Vic, JJ, and then Ethan. Uh, and they're best friends. They started making content together back in 2013 uh, under the banner The Ultimate Sidemen playing GTA and so on. Um, so actually, I've got a clip now. I thought I'd give you guys a couple of minutes of one of their recent videos. It's a bit of a flavor of who they are and I guess the, the randomness sometimes and the humor. Um, this is from Hole in the Wall, which is a video that they produced a, couple, a few weeks ago now. Oh, actually, no, sorry, firstly, firstly. A um, bit about their numbers, and then I'll get into Hole in the Wall. So across their channels, in case you guys don't know as well, they have three main channels. So main channel, more Sidemen, and Sidemen Reacts, um, and 16.3 million on their main channel, 6.8 on their second, 4.7 on their third, and growing all the time. Um, so crazy numbers. The biggest, again, I've seen in the UK and one of the biggest in Europe. So yeah, here's that sample from Hole in the Wall. Hello and welcome to Sidemen Hole in the Wall. Rules are very simple. A wall will approach you with a shape cut out of it. It is your job to match that shape. If you fail to match the shape of the wall, you'll fall in the pool. However, if you get through the shape, 
and don't hit the wall and you will get 10 points for your team. And the team with the most points wins. And at the end, the losing team has a forfeit wall to face. Let's introduce our team captains. First off, on Team Red, we have JJ. <laughs> Whenever you're ready. Up here, please. Yeah. JJ, up here, man. <laughs> you're such a dickhead, I swear. No, I hate you so it's much. It's nearly three o'clock, I hate you so much. <laughs> Are you excited? You're taking your time getting it. <laughs> yes, All right. OK, welcome in the blue team, Captain. We have Harry. Oh, oh, my God! Yeah! Yeah! Woo! Woo! Oh, I hate you so much. Oh. <laughs> Hello. OK, much more excited than yes. JJ was, clearly. <laughs> Hello. You know what, right? <laughs> OK, so we're in team picks for your team. And Harry, you can go first, because this guy's taken too long to even get here. OK. You can pick anyone from the rest of the group to be on your team. Think about it wisely. <laughs> I'm between two, right? Mini Minter is just naturally good at this kind of stuff. And he is man. flexible. Flexible, long limbs is what I feel like might let him down. But he's tall, yeah. However, after seeing his performance on the inflatables the other week, okay. I'm going to go with Vic Star on my team. Vic OK. Star. Blue team, Vic Star 1, 2, 3, come through. Whoa! Whoa! Oh, I can see anything going already. All right. This is a shuffle. <laughs> JJ. Am I going to get much words out of you, are I? Simon. <laughs> so what? Simon. You want Simon? Simon. Why? Because he's going to be good. Sorry? What? Simon. Uh, Simon, you're uh, the first pick on the red team. <laughs> I don't want to be here. I don't want to be on this <laughs> It's a long day for you, my friend. Oh. It's a long day. I don't want to be on your team. Simon. Oh. Look at this. Hey, Simon. Hey, Simon. Oh, God. Simon, welcome. Welcome to my team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that face still haunts me. Uh, yeah, to the boys. Um, as you can imagine, no two days are the same with these guys, honestly. It's, yeah, nuts. Um, but that's a good example, I think, of just a piece of content which hopefully pushes the bar. The boys are spending more than they've ever spent on their videos. I think that video got to 10 million views within the first week, I believe. And that Waterman character now is what going down in Simon history is one of the funniest from JJ. Um, so to look at the numbers um, of the boys, these are three stats which I think are, I think, my favorite, really. Um, 60 million average watch time every month across that main channel, uh, 200 million views every month plus. The numbers just keep going up and up. And my favorite of all uh, is 14 million people come back to the main channel every single month. So 14 million unique people come back. That always blows my mind. That was 10 million, I think, three or four months ago. So in that time, the level of retention from 16.3 million subscribers with 14 million coming back every month, that for me is, is an absolute win and shows the boys are doing something right. Um, and we're building in the most exciting industry in the world. I think, as you guys all know, the creator economy is on fire at the minute. Um, it's the most popular job in the world, uh, more than three times more popular than being an astronaut. And if you go to any country where, obviously, you know, social and content is alive and thriving, which is most, um, you will always rank. You speak to people under 18 years old, they all want to be YouTubers. They all want to be content creators. Um, so it's a very exciting time. Um, more than two million creators now make over six figures per year and this is the most ever, so the opportunity to really make a career and a life out of this is, is here for the first time. Uh, 165 million people have joined the creator economy in the last two years alone, uh, with 40% growth in the US. It's staggering. The industry is already big, but it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, so I think we're all in the right place. 17% uh, of creators are business owners, with 39% aspiring to become one one day, and I think that's something that I'll touch on. But the opportunity to create businesses, develop IP, is, again, more ripe than ever before. Uh, $16 billion in market value across the creator economy, and 1.3 billion euros, which I think is really cool, spent by brands on influencer marketing in Europe alone. So really exciting. The numbers couldn't be more promising, I think, for all of us here, uh, and shows, again, that I think we're all in the right place. Um, and this has allowed us to launch a whole suite of brands. And I think hopefully for the boys, this has been, I guess, the, the crowning moment, if you will, of this next chapter, which is the launch of these businesses and these pieces of IP. Um, the one in the back, I don't know if you guys saw that, but we launched a side cards brand with Tops um, UK, which has done really well. But Side Plus, the membership club, uh, was launched back in September last year. 
um, growing really well, and that's a premium membership club, including three original shows, giveaways. Um, we do $100,000 giveaways to fans every, every three months. Um, we gave away Ethan's car and so on and so forth. Um, so that's a real community there that's grown. Then XX Vodka, premium vodka brand, um, which is done brilliantly on e-com, is growing rapidly. We just did our first drop in the US, and um, we're expanding into new territories as we speak. And then Sides. So Sides is the fried chicken brand for the boys, of all things. Um, but fried chicken brand that's now in over three countries. We've got over 100 ghost kitchens in the UK, uh, and we're expanding out to America. We've got 200 sites lined up in India uh, and across the world. So Sides is really doing its thing. Um, and then Sideman Clothing, I'm sure you guys will know it. And then Side Cards, as is behind, behind with the, yeah, the, the trading cards. Um, so we've got five brands on the go and more coming. Uh, it's just the beginning. And I think it's a signal really uh, for myself and all of us, hopefully here, that when you have that scale and that audience and the desire to create IP, if you deploy them with the right quality and creativity, they resonate with your audience and they can become businesses bigger, hopefully, than the Sidemen even is. That's our ultimate aim. Um, so what can we all learn from the Sidemen? I thought this was more important than anything, really. Obviously, talking about what we've done is one thing. But how can you guys hopefully take something away from what the boys do and hopefully from my learnings from working with them for the, for the last year and a half? So, of course, with everything we do with the boys, there's seven of them, so I thought seven sort of golden rules for you guys um, from, learn, from my time working with the Sidemen so far. So the first one uh, is this, evolve or be extinct. This was a tweet, actually, that Josh posted out uh, in 2014, which I'm very glad that they listened to, because fast forward however many years later, and they've managed to evolve, and they're definitely not extinct. But also, I think Logan, on the screen there, who we caught this when we did the last Tinder video, he really represents this, this idea of Evolve will be extinct. Obviously, we all remember when Logan got cancelled back in, <laughs> a few years ago now, uh, and it was the end for him, it seemed. But how he's managed to transform his career over the last few years, I know he's not the sideman, but it's astonishing, I think, watching it and seeing somebody who's grown, who's taken accountability, and who's now stepped up into this incredible new phase. Obviously, he's got Prime with JJ, he's got his originals DAO, he's got all sorts going on. Um, and it's a testament, I believe, to ev evolution and not remaining still and stuck. Um, and this is more important than ever. We have changing algorithms, new platforms coming up. I mean, who saw TikTok coming, right, in the way that it did? The time for evolution and evolving is now more than ever. Um, because, yeah, if you don't, then you will get caught behind. So, yeah, never settle, never sit still. Always strive for more and more and more. The second one uh, is that the team makes the dream. And this is something that we've definitely found with the boys. I think behind them, and not many people would know this, but there's about 150 people, including the chefs at Sides, the people at the Vodka brand, the people inside Plus, and so on, who are really making this whole machine work. Um, they have a team of 15 editors, I'd say, um, designers, art directors, obviously us as management. There's a whole business structure beneath them now. And I think looking back over the last year and a half, no, none of the scale, none of the ambition that they've had could have been realized without all of those people pulling together. And with limited time that they have, they need to be focused on doing what they do best, which is making content, right? They don't need to be in boardrooms every day dealing with the minutiae of people and cultures and staff and so on. Uh, and they have gaps, of course. They have gaps in experience and expertise, restricted connections, so they need people to plug the gaps. I think for you guys, thinking about the team, thinking about how to bring people along with you is absolutely essential. Um, and yeah, without the right cogs behind the scenes, ideas will stay just as they are, which is ideas. So the third one uh, is this, consistency, consistency, and more consistency. Um, I think the boys, more than anything, demonstrate that being consistent over a decade now is, the, is really the key in order to succeed. To have consistency and to be constantly creating new ideas, developing, I think the boys do, I'll work this out, a main channel video every week, two more Sidemen videos a week, three Reacts videos a week, they do three Side Plus shows a week, and then they also do any content for Volker sides, clothing, and so on. So the sheer work rate that goes into this, like nothing I've ever seen, but that's why they're so successful in there where they are right now. Um, next, make decisive calls. So I think one thing that really typifies the boys, and it's a joy to work with, is they're very decisive. So they have a system, which I call the Supreme Court of the Sidemen, where there are seven of them. They always have a majority, so four wins. Once you get to four, 
there's a decision. And I love that mindset because working with talent before, it can be quite difficult, I found, even as an individual, to make decisions and to get going. And I think one thing that they all believe in, and I believe in it massively, is that perfectionism is an enemy. If you're trying to be perfect and make something bang on, you're likely to fail because of the speed required to move in this industry. You have to keep going, you have to keep making decisions and moving at pace. And even if you try and it doesn't work, that's better than not trying at all. Um, so yeah, go hard or go home is definitely the philosophy and make calls and make them fast and make them in a decisive way. Uh, the next one, hold yourself accountable. So I think this is really key. One thing, I know this is a picture of Harry, but one thing that I have an immense amount of admiration for in JJ specifically, KSI, is his ability to be honest so brutally with his audience when they tell him that something isn't good. I don't know if you guys remember the KSI show that he did, but when that didn't get the reception that he maybe wanted, he did a whole video talking about how it was an L, how things weren't perfect in it, and the audience responded brilliantly. Same with his boxing fight recently, when Alex Wasabi pulled out um, and he replaced him with Swarms, and the lineup he had, there was a bad response. So he came out and said, this is an L, I have to hold it. And the, I guess the humility and the the confidence he must have in himself to be able to do that is astonishing, but I think it's a real lesson for us all. Hold the L's, hold the W's, um, and do what your audience expects, which I think is to be 100% open with them. Um, the next one is be always value-driven. So this is something at the core of everything we do with the boys, and it's at the core of how they work as well. What is the value you're giving to your audience? It's something which, looking at what they do, they invest a lot of money. Mr. Beast does the same thing back into their content, obviously at a different scale, but back into their content to make sure that the entertainment is of another level, the things are always pushing up and up and up. And I think you always want to think, what does your audience get after finishing your content? Do they feel happier? Are they more entertained? Do they have a cry? Like, what was it that you gave them in terms of value um, that they didn't have before? And if you can answer that, then again, you're on the right track, I think. Again, not that I'm in any way an expert in content like these boys are, but watching them, this is something that's really key to their whole structure and operation. So focus on value, and the rest will follow. And then, and then lastly, uh, enjoy the ride. This is something which, again, is a joy to be around. They are so happy, and they love what they do. And when you go into the studio and they're filming, they're having the time of their lives together. They are seven genuine best friends, and that comes across. And I think for any content creator, they can take something from that spirit of just having a good time with it, not taking it too seriously. It's the best industry in the world, this, honestly. There's nothing better, I think. Um, so enjoy every minute, and then it will never feel like work, and the content you do will be 10 times better. But what is the number one secret source to nearly a decade of success for these boys? So I think looking at it, and I've thought about this a lot, like what is the thing that if I could take anything from what they do, what is the one thing that really is the driving force behind why they're able to do what they do and to be doing it for so long? And I think it's this. It's to be 100% of yourself 100% of the time, and then you'll never get old. It's something when I look at all of them and I see them, when they're off camera, they're exactly the same as when they're on. When they're just talking in business meetings, they're having a laugh, they're joking around, but the people who are on screen are the same people when they're just chilling on the sofa in the studio. And I think it sounds a bit cringe and corny, but it is, I believe, actually the main thing. Because ultimately, being themselves, they never get tired of the act they're trying to put on because they're not putting on one. I think one thing that JJ, for example, on Sidecast recently said was that when he started in music, he felt this immense pressure to be this rapper and to be this tough guy. But actually, it wore him out because he wasn't being honest and true to himself. So he started to resent it and hate it and didn't enjoy the process anymore. So I think actually, thinking to then when he said the way that he has now conquered music and he's done amazingly well, and I think all the boys can relate to this, is because he's 100% him. So I think in anything you do, looking at the boys and, and what is the one thing that has made them so successful for so long, it's that it's being 100% of yourself 100% of the time, and you'll never get old or bored. Um, and that's, I think, how you create true longevity, how you future-proof your brand, and how you connect with an audience, which means, ultimately, that you end up with this. Because if you're 100% yourself, you become the best friend to your entire audience. And then they connect with you on a level that makes them so galvanized that they'll want to go, and not that they should be doing this, but that they want to go and invade the pitch just to get a selfie with you, just to be next to you, just to be in the same room or in the same environment as you. So that's, I think, how you truly deliver audience and create something as these boys have, which is a phenomenon. So thank you very much.
open for any questions. Thank you. Hey. Hey. Uh, thanks a lot for your input. Uh, I think a lot of people here in the industry and the doc market are on the same page when it comes to the topics you've mentioned, um, especially like the authenticity part. Um, I think like the connection between community and creator can't be real if there's a mask on the creator yeah. side. Totally on your point. I have a little in-depth question. I don't know if mm. it's something you can answer. Yeah. Um, but do you have an ROI when it comes to the pro production of the videos? Uh, just looking at the natural resources you're getting, like AdSense, subscription, stuff like that. Mm. Or are you always investing into the content and just getting the money back from better placements in the future on? Yeah. So quality scales the pricing of the marketing value. Yeah, so I think for the boys, the, I guess, yeah, the way that they are able to invest what they do is because of all these other new revenue streams and the fact they've broken away from purely AdSense. I think, is AdSense enough at their level? It's enough for something sizable, but it still doesn't give you that 100% comfort and security because it's one revenue stream. So I think it's like with anything, right? Diversification is really important and having multiple streams of income. So now the boys have that. They've got that through clothing, through size, through vodka, through all these other brands. Uh, they are a bit more comfortable to say, well, actually, if we invest X amount into Escape Room, for example, which was their most um, expensive video to date, then we're not we're not feeling it in the same way that we would have done if we just had the channel revenue, and it's more of a more of a I guess more of a risk, right? So I think that's where they're at now, where they have the freedom, and that freedom financially enables them to think bigger and create better ideas, which I think is similar to what Mr. Beast says, right, as well with his ideas, where you can throw four or however many million into Squid Game um, because he's making so much from all these different streams that he can invest that back in. Thank you. That's awesome. Um, hi there. Uh, hey. First off, uh, thanks a lot for the insight you gave, and especially, um, sorry. Okay, uh, and um, especially um, the, the process of decision making um, that gets much easier if you have seven guys. Um, but anyone who has worked with talent or influencers knows that um, you don't always see eye to eye, especially with all the projects you guys do. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about some of the challenges? you guys face with yeah. having seven guys that have to be on the same page, ideally, at all times? Yeah, of course. So, um, yeah, I mean, look, it's not easy all the time. Um, but actually, I think it's a lot easier than the same with one. It's really weird. I haven't worked with so many creators, traditional talent, TV presenters, whatever, in before. Working with seven is so much easier because you end up always, because of, and I think to preface that, it's because of their attitude to it. They know that they are all equal. There's no dominant voice. There's no leader. They're all completely equal. So ultimately, there's a sense of detachment around, I might think this is a good idea, but if the other guys think it's better and they vote it in, then it's a decision. So that level of, I guess, detachment and humility, which I think if I was to add another one on there, it would be them being humble and having a sort of egoless approach to the way they work means that they can sit around a table, we can sit with them, present ideas, talk through ideas, and even if they have disagreement, they always come to a decision. So I think because they've been doing it for so long, they've had to find a way of putting their emotions to the side and saying, right, if the boys want it and they win the vote, even if I think it's a bad idea, it's for the greater good. And that's their attitude with everything. So it's very impressive. And I think it's meant that ultimately, yeah, they've managed to succeed for so long. In terms of challenges, I think, some of the challenges aren't really so much about the decision making. That's actually, I think, the easiest bit. The hardest bit is when we're going into all these new verticals, it's them feeling comfortable and all of us feeling comfortable with the lack of control. Because when you start entering things like food and you're making fried chicken every day, not that we're making it, and things go wrong and they're on the precipice of complaints and people talking on Twitter and saying, well, what happened to this? Did this delivery driver miss my order, whatever it is. That feel, the challenge is actually almost an interior one for them where they have to feel comfortable with not being in control because they're so used to making a video, editing it, having it perfect and it going out. So that's, that, that's probably the biggest challenge we faced is feeling comfortable with the uncomfortable when launching these new verticals. And I think ultimately though, that is where you get the best results is when you are a little bit uncomfortable and you have to also grow as a, as a group or as a, as a team, um, if that makes sense. Uh, thank you at first for the uh, nice insights and presentation. Uh, just to have some kind of idea about the production value of the videos, yeah. do you have, some, of course you don't have exact numbers, but maybe you have some kind of like range, what you can think of, obviously it also varies like from format to format as well, yeah. but um, what's like the 
cheapest to the highest production value you did like for the yeah so i think you know something like you know when you're building sets like hole in the wall would have been six figures easily right to make the sets to create all the different movements and the gullies and all this there's a lot of production going in there those are very expensive you balance that with something like a mukbang or one of the videos that are more chilled and they're pretty much nothing, right? Um, so I, think it's a f I mean, it's a full range. The US trip, I think they mentioned that cost them about half a million to put on, to go to the States, to bring all the crew. They said it on, a pod on uh, one of the streams or podcasts or something. Um, so half a million just to go out there for three videos. <laughs> so it's a lot. Um, but again, when they know that those videos, like the Tinder one, the, the um, road trip, and the holiday video, those are the three biggest videos of the, la of the last six weeks. You know, it, it balances out and it's a worthwhile investment. Um, and I think also they've got so much data now around, we know that this type of video does well and can generate this amount of income. So if we invest into it, you know you're going to be making it back and a profit. So there is almost now that level of, you know, return on investment, as you said before, um, that goes into it all. How easy or how difficult is it to bring all these um, yeah, creators together for their production? Because I guess they have their own things to do as well. How do you deal with yeah. Yeah, getting the production done? Yeah, well, I think, um, interestingly, so I was saying this before, before I jumped on. I think there's a blend, right? Some of them have a lot of individual stuff going on. Others are pretty much just sidemen because sidemen now over the last two years or so has become a full-time job in itself. It's as much as any of the individual projects because they're, again, filming, you know, main channel every week, second channel twice a week, uh, reacts three times a week, side plus. So they're doing so much together now that actually this is kind of the home of, of a lot of their lives. Um, obviously, JJ is an exception. Josh is a you know, massive streamer in his own right, and a few of them have other big things going on. Um, but now, Sidemen has become this beast. So to bring them all together is almost it's essential. They have to make it work, or else the whole thing collapses. So they all know that, and they all work towards that. So actually, it's quite easy in a way, because they base their whole lives off, of, I think, around this. Um, yeah, for better or for worse, really. Hi. Um, thank you so much. Sure. A little question. They all have individual stuff going on themselves. So the question would be, how much can you plan on getting their projects, for example, like the last JJ Boxing event, into working stuff for the sidemen? Yeah. Finding so that, and, and the follow-up question would be, do they all have individual managements for themselves? And how much of a problem in the day-to-day -day business with yeah. you as a group management yeah. and them as individual working together? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. So the first one, yeah, around um, when somebody like JJ has this fight, how, does, how do we sort of schedule and make everything work around that? And I think that's really the boys, they do all of that. So they are very good at saying, for example, JJ had fight camp for 12 weeks, I think, before the fight. So he was out of all Sidemen content from... <laughs> June, no, June, May, and there was a big block in the calendar which was just like fight camp, like cannot move. Things like that happen, right? And for somebody like him, he's touring at the minute, for example, you know, he's got other things coming up as well. So I think with, um, yeah, with, with him, he's, a, he's an exception in that sense because he's doing four or five different things. For some of the other boys, their whole life is side men and that's all they do. In terms of management question, um, I think JJ is actually the only one with a distinct management team around him because of all the things he's doing. A lot of the other boys have various different people they work with, but still, because Sidemen is so dominant, the vast majority of their time is in this. And I think it's become more and more, as it's become more and more successful and bigger and a franchise in its own right, there's less, I think, time, but also maybe incentive to do so much else separately. So although they do have that, and some of them, again, have incredible things going on in their own right, it's very difficult to balance that with the sheer demand of, of the Sidemen because it's now so big. Amazing. Well, thank you guys so much. It's been fun. Thank you.